8 at the bottom 408 
I reckon they got the flu, so y'all pray for them. And uh, y'all pray for us when we try to sing. Let's do page 19. <laughs>
while she continues playing, if you got anything to put in the offering plate, let's bring that forward right now. mentioned last week about doing uh, some baskets for Christmas for food baskets and uh, Sister Kim knows more about that him and uh, Sister Kim has been talking about that so she's going to come let you know more about that and then I'll make the rest of them out. Good morning. If you know me you know I don't like talking in front of people so I'm a little nervous. But when a pastor asks you to do something, you say yes. So Brother John mentioned he had a burden for um, families in the neighborhood uh, for Christmas this year. So we want to put together some uh, boxes full of food to make a Christmas meal for the community of families who need it. Uh, but we need your help. So um, he's come up with a menu to put in the boxes. And if you got your bulletin today, you've received this. It has a menu on it. Um, if you have these products you can bring in, we'll have a box out front, you can put them in, or um, if you don't want to bring food, we'll take money, and me or somebody else will go to Sam's and we'll buy bulk, which means we get cheaper boxes. Um, I put every, all the food together, and I've got the box down to $25. Um, so if you want to donate to feed a family, it's $25 for a box. Um, you can donate more boxes if you want. It's up to you. Um, so, let's see. If you could bring, I put on here, I did this yesterday, but if it says if you could bring by the 22nd, but actually if you could bring by the 21st, that gives us two days to put boxes together to be able to hand out on the 23rd. We're just going to open the doors of the church and then come in and get what they need. Um, and hopefully more than they need <laughs> from the church. Um, Brother John is also asked some local businesses for help um, to help with the price of food and stuff. Um, he has t typed up a donation letter that he's already taken to several businesses on Thompson Bridge I and I've got a copy of the letter outside. If you're willing to do that, take it to a business and ask for help. Um, I've got also got a list out there of places he's already been so you don't have to revisit them. But we just need help and I think this is a great opportunity to help our community. Thank you. Okay, so this morning we got several things going on. Uh, after service this morning, Brother Jeff and Sister Tammy need to meet with all the happy pilgrims right up front uh, about the outing that they got planned for next weekend. Uh, also today, after church, I need all the help, and Miss Michelle needs all the help that we can get to help decorate for Christmas in the sanctuary and in the fellowship hall. So that's immediately after church today. Uh, December the 5th, we got Sister Grace Wimpy's baby shower after the morning service, so be in the fellowship hall. Also, on the 5th, we got youth choir practice right after service, so got quite a few things going on. So uh, remember those, and then on December the 12th, Brother Stacy Roberts, They've called him to pastor at Temple Baptist Church over in Homer. So uh, his ordination is going to be at 5 o'clock at Temple Baptist Church in Homer at, uh, I think it's Homer, right? Uh, so it's going to be at 5 o'clock. I do want to try to get the choir to go. So all we can get of the choir, uh, we'd love to have you to come. And those that don't sing in the choir and would like to help us, come be with us and help us sing. Uh, that's all I got, so we'll go ahead. We're missing out on the good life, according to men of degree. We're missing out on life's normal pleasures. Standards of worldly belief. 
patient. They claim that we're all turned around, but they cannot. going to come preach for us so dear if you will come on up uh good to see our visitors and it's good to see one of our old ones that's back sister nicole good to see you and your family here today i appreciate y'all coming and visiting with us can you hear me can you hear me now all right it's an honor to be back with you. I was here just earlier this month, but uh, I just don't like the circumstances. Brother John, we hope you're getting better up there, so take care of yourself, and we're at prayer for you. Um, if you will, be turning your Bibles to Psalm 23, probably the most famous ver chapter in the Bible. Psalm 23. Most of y'all could even quote this. If you will, stand with us out of honor to God's word. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to ask Brother, is Brother Ron here? Brother Ron, could you lead us in prayer? Amen. You can be seated. Now, I want to tell you, last, uh, yesterday, Brother John called me, and I was in Panama City. <laughs> and I told him, I'm coming back tonight. We'll, we'll uh, get there, brother. And I want to say, we got in after 1230 last night. So if anybody's going to fall asleep on this sermon, it better be me. <laughs> if I see some of y'all nodding off, we're in trouble, because I might go with you. Uh First of all, I want to look at Psalm 23. I know this has been preached so many times. Like I said, even some of the children could even quote this scripture. But there's some things in here that I, I've seen that I just want to share with you this morning. Children, well, uh, have y'all ever heard the game Follow the Leader? Y'all like that game Follow the Leader? Well, tonight, I mean, this morning, we are going to uh, preach on follow the leader. Follow the leader. Now, this is a game I played as a kid. You know, the leader does something, everybody else does it. Leader goes, you go. Whatever the leader does, you do. Now, too many times that's lost here in Psalm 23. The whole chapter is about following the leader. 
The entire chapter from beginning to end is about following the leader. So the first thing I want you to notice is we have to define who the leader is. Because if I wanted to play follow the leader, we didn't define it. I thought Terry was the leader. Terry looked over here and he thought Brother Ron was the leader. And Brother Ron looked and he thought uh, Brother Vickers was the leader. And I'm following him, he's following him, he's following him. All we're going to have is a bunch of chaos. A bunch of chaos. Because nobody knows who the leader is. And we're all following different people. And there's nothing but a bunch of mess. There's no coordination to it. There is no system to it. So we have to first of all define who the leader is. Now I want, to know, I want you to know when me and Terry and Brother Lloyd and Brother Ron go play, we play follow the leader when we play golf. One goes in the woods, we all go in the woods. One goes in the lake, we all go in the lake. But, I want to, but there is something here, in all, in all honesty. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now I want you to notice the way that's mentioned. It's not L, capital L, little O, little R, little D. All the letters are capitalized in that word. The reason is it's a name. It is Jehovah. Matter of fact, if you go to four times in the Old Testament, that word is uh, interpreted, it's uh, translated as Jehovah. That's Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. Psalm 83, 18, Isaiah 12, 2, Isaiah 26, 4, all take this same Greek, I mean Hebrew word and translate it to Jehovah. It is his name. He is literally defining who the leader is. There is no doubt about it. It's not, there's no way that it's Buddha. There's no way it's Muhammad. There's no way it's Allah. The shepherd is Jehovah. The shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my shepherd. He is my leader. And I will follow that leader. And I want you to notice the next uh, phrase in that. It says, I shall not want. So many people claim these verses. And they are true. But they claim the verses of... Um, my God, uh, in Philippians chapter 4, 19, it says, my, But my God shall supply all your riches, uh, all your needs according to his riches in glory. We want to hold on to that. Oh, he's going to supply my every need. And we also hold on to where Psalm, uh, David wrote over in Psalm 37, 25. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. But there's a little condition there. The Lord has to be your shepherd. See, when we're not following the leader, when we follow the wrong leader, I remember a prodigal son, he got to following himself. And you know what? He wound up in a hog pen. And he couldn't sustain himself because he started following his own desires. He started following his own wants. He started trying to fulfill his own flesh. And he wound up in want. He wound up begging if we want to have our needs supplied, if we want it to be supplied, our every need, guess what? We're going to have to have a shepherd. We're going to have to follow the leader. But I want you to notice something else. We defined who that leader is. Young man, would you, uh, what's your name? Bernie? Brady. Okay. Brady, could you help me today? Okay, today you've got some big shoes to fill. You're Jesus. So come on up here, brother. I just want to show you something about this. So we're playing follow the leader. So just for a second, I want you to see something. I'm going to follow you. You don't worry about me. It's my job to follow Jesus. So wherever Jesus goes, I'm going. Wherever Jesus walks, I'm going to walk. Now I want you to notice something. I'm not looking to my left hand. I'm not looking to my right hand. I'm not looking behind me. My eyes are on Jesus. You know what? I can't tell what you're doing right now. I have no idea if you're smiling, if you're mad, if you're happy, no matter what. Okay, you can just take a seat right there, brother. I'm going to use you in just a second. Notice, when my eyes were on Jesus, I wasn't worried about y'all. Too many times people say, well, I don't go to that church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, guess what? Don't stop you from going to Walmart, does it? Why? Because when you go to Walmart, you don't care what they're doing. You're worried about getting your TV. You're worried about getting whatever you went in there for. 
If we would treat church the same way, I don't care what they're doing. My job is to come in. I have a different purpose. My job ain't to see what they're doing, how they're acting. My job, I have a different purpose. Just like when you go into Walmart, your mission is to get that TV. You don't care about what they're doing. When you come into church, your job is to follow the leader. And when your eyes are on Jesus, you ain't going to worry about, oh, they're texting. Are they, are they doing this? Are they doing that? Oh, look at them. No, your eyes are on the leader. And you're only going to get out of church what you put into it. If you're coming in trying to look at everybody else, that's where you're going to walk out feeling empty. You're going to feel, go walk out feeling like I got nothing out of that service. But when you walk into these services saying, God, I'm here to lift your name. I'm here to magnify your name. My eyes are on you. Guess what? You're going to get something out of it. We need to follow the leader. The next thing, he restoreth my son. I mean, he ma maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. Now, I want you to notice something. If you follow the leader, this is what happens. He's going to take you to some green pastures. And sometimes he's got to make you lie down in green pastures. <laughs> some of us stubborn Baptists, he has to make us do some good stuff, don't he? But I want you to notice, he leads me to this green pasture. And just stop right there real quick, brother. I've noticed two types of Christians in Psalm 2, I mean Psalm 23-2 and Psalm 23-3. The first type of Christian I've noticed in Psalm 23-2 is he leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He making me to lie down in green pastures. Sometimes in your life, God is going to say, stand still. Sit down. Don't move. He told Moses to tell him, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He says, be still and know that I am God. There's times that he says, just stop. He told Elijah, you, you're about to go on a long journey. You need to stay here and you need to rest. But we have some types of Christians that they get ahead of God. God, I can't stay. This bill is due by this date. I got to do something about it. God, this has got to be done right now. I got to do something about it. And what we do is instead of following Jesus, we get ahead of Jesus. And we leave Jesus behind. And we become one of the one, uh, one, of the one that he left the 99 for because we done got off in the world. We get ahead of God. Sometimes he leads us and says, sit, sit still. Graze a little bit. It's time. You've been through so much. You need to be restored. You need a rest. You need to get built back up. And that's what he does. But with some, we just get so ahead of God. I can't. I've got to figure this out. And he already has the answer. But in our own willingness to try to figure it out on our own, we get ahead of God and he has to come find us. Verse 3, I see another type of Christian. He says, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here's the other type of Christian I see. Oh, we didn't got in this green grass. Good water. Mmm, this is good. I'm in my comfort zone. Jesus says, okay, it's time to go. We need to go lead us down the paths of righteousness. No, God, no, 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 no. This is a good place. This is a good place right here. I'm in my comfort zone. I don't want to get out. I don't want to leave this spot. But what the Savior knows is that brook's about to dry up. That grass is not about, to, about to turn brown. He says, I've got to take you to the next one. But we get so far in our comfort zone. And when God says to move, we don't want to move. Because it requires us to get up and do a little bit of work. I like laying down. I like the food being right there. I like the water being right there. So we have them two types of Christians, those that want to get ahead of God and those that want to stay in their comfort zone. And we see that in Psalm 23, 2 and 3. Now, I'm still going to use you, brother. I appreciate you helping me out. You didn't know you were going to get put on the spot, did you? But notice what he also says. Verse 4. Yea. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. This is so amazing. I'm about to, 
I heard this from a preacher, and then God showed me even more. What makes a valley? What makes a valley? What? Two mountains, two hills, you got it. That's what creates a valley. So if we have a valley in Psalm 23, what do we have in Psalm 22? Let's look. Verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where have you heard that before? On Mount Calvary. Let's go on down. Verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lip and shake, their head, shake the head saying, He trusted on the Lord that would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. I think I remember the Pharisees saying that to Jesus while he was hanging on the cross. Save thyself. See if the Lord will deliver him. Oh, let's keep on looking. Because in uh, verse 16, For the dogs have compassed me about. They ascend, uh, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Again, we see that on Mount Calvary. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. So in Psalm 22, that is Mount Calvary. Psalm 23, we have a valley of the shadow of death. So I wonder, is there another mountain in Psalm 24? Let's see. Psalm 24, verse 3, who shall ascend into the holy hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? You know where that was? That was Mount Zion. If you do a study, that's, that's referring to Mount Zion. And if you look, if you go over to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, it compares Mount Zion and Jerusalem to heaven. I want to give you something right here. So right here, I'm in Psalm 22. I'm at the place of the cross. This is where I met the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I'm living in the shadow of the cross. And I look over the valley. And I can see heaven on the other side. I can see the Psalm 24 on the other side where my God is. I want to get there. But you want to know what? To get from this mountain to that mountain. You know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to go through a valley. But it says, don't worry. I'll be with you. And as he walks through that valley of the shadow of death, notice it ain't nothing but a shadow. A shadow can't hurt you. It's a shadow of death. Then he can get to the other side. We made our journey. We started our journey at the cross. We've been living our life here at the cross. But one day we're going to make that journey. Everybody must make that journey to get to the other side. But I about had holy goosebumps right here. There's one way I can get to the other side without going through a valley. If some outside force like a helicopter was to pick me up off of one mountain and carry me to the other, I'm telling you, those which are alive and remain shall be caught up. You know, one day there's going to be an outside force. And then we which are alive and remain, we may not have to go through that valley. Some out, outside force by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may just pick us up, carry us through the air over to the other mountain, and we won't have to worry about the valley. Now we see that in Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24. Oh, but this gets even better. For he says, I'm going to have to calm myself. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Brother, you can go sit down just for a second. I'll be using you again in just a minute. But I want you to notice this. A lot of your Bible scholars will make this statement. You'll have two thoughts on this. Number one, you'll have those that say this continues with the shepherd theme. This continues with the shepherd theme. And then others will say, well, because there's a cup in there and there's a table, we're actually referring to a king. Because David was also a king. David was a shepherd and he was a king. So he understood how both worked. Now I'm about to give you something right here. I think they both fit. 
because he was shepherd and he was king. And notice how God works his word out to where you can get multiple things, multiple nuggets. You may not even see it the first time, but he always helps you when you need it. Now, the first thing, let's look at the shepherd. What would a shepherd do? He would prepare a table. Do you realize when he went out before a field up there, that was literally called a table. And the shepherd would go out there and he would start preparing it. He would throw some minerals, some salts, and in the presence of my enemies. You know what else he would do? He would go find little snake holes. Because what would happen would be while the um, sheep would be grazing, little snakes would come out of their holes and bite, wrap on the little sheep right on the nose. And it would, the venom would kill them. But you know what the shepherd would do? Before he let those little sheep go out, he would take the oil, the Holy Ghost, and he would go find those snake holes. And he'd start pouring the oil around the snake holes. And he'd pour oil on that little sheep's nose. That way when that snake tried to come out of that hole, it'd slide right back down. It couldn't. But if one does to get out, that, uh, that was a protective barrier right there so that uh, little snake couldn't grab onto that sheep. He prepared, went out and he prepared that table in the presence of his enemies. Jesus went out and he seen the uh, place we was going to graze. And he took care of those snakes. He took care of the snake, the devil. And he will protect you. If you stay with him, he knows what he's doing. Now, I want you to notice he would also watch, uh, keep on watch while the sheep grazed for those lions, for those bears, for those whatever would come up and try to get those sheep. He would be on uh, standby. Notice David killed a lion and a bear for his sheep. So when we're here grazing, guess what? We ain't got to worry about Satan. God's already got him. God's already sent his angels to protect us. He even says he, uh, the angels of the Lord encamp around us. He's got us. But here's another thing. David was also a king. Do you realize what they would do when they would do a peace treaty? When they would do a peace treaty, they would bring this, all the sides in, and they would sit down and have a meal, a peace treaty meal. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Enemies have come in, but you know what they would do, Terry? They would take oil and they would anoint uh, the head of the guest of honor. Guess what? You may be in the presence of enemies right now, but even over in uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, he says he can even make his enemies to be at peace with you. You may be facing battles with some enemies right now, but God says you are a child of the king. And guess what? I can bring them to the uh, table, to the peace talks. I can make things better. I can make you to be at peace with your enemies. And you know what they're going to have to do? They're going to have to sit and watch you be the guest of honor. See, we always think, as a Christian, we've got it the worst. We always think, as a Christian, we have to take sack at best. You're a child of the king. He says, if you'll just follow me, and do as I say. Now I want you to notice, this is where we get into depression. You don't have to do a lot of drinking real quick. Okay. Now, here's how we're conditioned. We even teach our kids to do this. We always say, when you look at a cup... Is it what? Half empty or half full? How do you look at it? Just think about that for a second. Do you look at it as half empty or half full? Oh, we're all going to say, oh, I look at it as half full. But that's where we've got trained by the world. That's where we got trained. What do you mean by that, Derek? I about got this thing down to half, half full. Okay, that's about half full. See, he says, my cup runneth over. We always look at our situation. Well, we've got to look at it as half empty or half full. But we shouldn't be looking at the blessings. The Bible teaches us to look at the vessel. Not what's on the inside. Of it. We need to look at the cup. 
See, when we get into this mode of thought, we always look at our situation that God hadn't blessed us that much. Our cup's half, half full. You know what we start doing? We start thinking of ourselves as bigger than what we are. God, I deserve more. God, I deserve a million dollar house. God, I deserve that $80,000 car. Why don't I have that? Why, does, why do they get it and I don't? And we start thinking ourselves, I deserve it. Why, God? We start thinking of ourselves as bigger than what we are. And that's why we are feeling empty today. We took that cup that was half empty or half full, and we, we made ourselves bigger. And now today we're feeling empty. Because I actually asked myself that one day. God showed that to me. I'm like, God, why am I going through this? When you're looking at the blessings, you ain't looking at what you are deserving. I thought I deserved more than what I, than what I was getting. I thought I was bigger than what I was. And you know what? My life was felt. I was felt leaving empty. I was empty on the inside. I was going into depression. Why? Why is this not working out for me? But God said, you know what, son? Pour this back in here. Oops. It's because this is not you. This is not you. See, I'm nothing but a little worm. See, I, I don't deserve nothing. God gave me two children. I'm blessed. God gave me a wonderful wife. I'm blessed. I don't have that mansion on the hill. I struggle to make ends meet a lot of times. I go from paycheck to paycheck, but I look at that little girl. I look at that boy run up to me and hug me and say, Daddy, you know what? You know what? That? And then I realize I don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. And God takes that same amount of blessings. And when I put it in perspective, guess what? My cup's just running over. I'm going to have to clean that up in a minute. I'm sorry. But my cup's running over because I realize I don't deserve it. God gave me another day on this earth. I didn't deserve that. If I got what I deserved, I'd be in a six foot under and burning in a lake of fire. Because guess what? I woke up this morning... My kids woke up. Guess what? I got something even better. I got the salvation. My Savior died for me. He says, don't rejoice in all this other stuff, but rejoice that your name's written in heaven. Guess what? Even if you don't wake up on this side tomorrow, you're going to wake up on a better side. You are blessed. Your cup's running over and you don't even realize it because we are feeling empty because we think we deserve more than what we've got. We need to start turning around and looking at God. I don't deserve that little girl. I don't deserve that little boy. I don't deserve that woman to be my wife. We need to start looking at the blessings you've got instead of saying, God, why ain't I got this? Why ain't I got that? And start looking, God, you've given me a lot. More than money can buy. What if he gave you that million-dollar mansion on the hill and the $80,000 dream car that you have, but he took away the family? What if he gave you what you wanted? Then you'd be saying, whoa, I did have blessings and didn't even realize it. Brother, could you come up here? And I'm going to get Joshua and Caleb. Could y'all come help me? I'm going to show you one last thing, and then I'll be done. Told you this thing started from the beginning. As follow the leader. And it ends as follow the leader. Because if I'm following Jesus, the Bible says goodness and mercy are going to follow me. Now, I'm not going to look at y'all. Y'all better stay with me. Wherever you go, Jesus, I'm going. I'm not worried about it. My eyes are focused on Jesus. And wherever, I go, wherever he goes, I go. And wherever I go, goodness is following. Mercy is following. I ain't got to look over my shoulder. My eyes are on Jesus. And mercy and goodness are following me. Everywhere he goes, I go. And it's a following me. Now, could we come back up to the front? Jesus, take us to the front. I'm following you, though. Wherever, wherever you go, I'm going. 
Now, when you get to the front, I want you to stop. I want to show you something. This is going to help you, especially in the next month or so. Now, now, goodness and mercy. Now, I want you to know, we're about to come up on a big time of year that people start making New Year's resolutions. I'm going to change. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Here's the thing. I'm going to challenge you to make a different resolution this year. Because here's what happens, especially during this time of year. People start saying, I'm going to do better. I'm going to start giving forgiveness to people I haven't been given. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start doing that. And these are all good intentions. I'm going to give you something right here that's going to help you because it helped me. What you're doing is, goodness and mercy, start walking that way. You stay. When I start trying to do better on my own, what am I doing? I turn my back on him, and I walked away. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. The minute I started saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to be better at this, I'm going to be better at that, I turn my back on Jesus and try to do it in my own power. I, I mean, they're commendable to try to do better, but when I follow after goodness and I follow after mercy on my own, I've turned my back. On the one. And notice Jesus didn't follow me because he's not. He's the leader. He might go look for me, but he don't follow me. Now, I want you to figure this out. Now, this is something that helped me. This year at New Year's resolution time, make a resolution to start reading your Bible more. Make a New Year's resolution to start praying more. You don't even got to wait till New Year's. You can do it today. Start making these resolutions. I'm going to follow Jesus better. I'm going to get closer to Jesus. And you want to know what? When you get your eyes on Jesus, that stuff's going to come a whole lot easier. Where you're try trying to fight to give mercy to somebody, to show them forgiveness, you're trying to do it in your own power, guess what? When your eyes are on Jesus and you start looking at how much he's forgave you, you start remembering the little rascal that you used to be. You start remembering all the sins he forgave you. Then you just turn around and, whoa. That's not, as hard, that's not as hard to forgive them now because I was a lot worse. They may have done me, and I'm going to give you another little tip right here, and I'm going to be closing. What's the second word in forgive? For? Say it a little louder. For? I've heard so many people say, well, they don't deserve my forgiveness. You want to know what? You are absolutely right. They don't deserve it. I didn't deserve it either. That's the reason it's called give. It's a gift. A gift is something you don't earn. And you know what? It helps you more than it helps them. When you finally get over some stuff and you finally forgive some people, you know what? You're giving them a gift, but you're getting a gift in return. They don't deserve it. They don't. You're giving them a gift. If it was called, a, if they deserved it, it'd be called a reward. It's time to start giving gifts, especially right here at Christmas time. Maybe somebody has hurt you so bad. Now, I'm not saying, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go put yourself back in the same position and be, get done the same way. I mean, the Bible does teach learning from the mistakes and stuff. But at the same time, you're not harnessing that bitterness. When you hear that name, anger and rage don't just boil up inside you anymore. When you meet them out at a restaurant, maybe you can speak to them. Where you used to couldn't do that. It's getting a little quiet right there. But when you follow Jesus, I'm telling you, if you start reading more, you start praying more, you start spending more time with him, that stuff's going to become more natural. And you ain't got to make all these resolutions that you're going to break in a week or two. If they'll come to the instruments and the song leader come. My question is, this morning, I know it's a little scattered, but I felt like I did what God said. Who are you following today? Who are you, a good way to figure that out is, who are you listening to? I hate to say it, I've done this a lot. Whenever you're trying to figure something out, the first place you should go is to your knees. 
But I'll be honest, I have found myself running to my wife first. I have found, I'm just being an honest Christian right here. I have found myself running to my dad first. What's your advice on this? Now, it ain't bad. It ain't bad to go ask advice from your spouse. It ain't bad to go ask advice from your pastor. But the first place you should hit is your knees. And then go to them. Then go to them. I don't know what you're facing here this morning, but I really believe this was the message that God laid on my heart. And I'm going to ask everybody just to bow their heads and close their eyes because I, I don't want anybody to walk out of here not knowing. This morning, if you're here today, you say, Brother Derek, that message helped me. 